The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Dean Smith, which is also shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips, and I call on Senator Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. When the Treasurer, Mr Chalmers, stands to his feet at 7.30 this evening, and when, as is the custom, Labor members of the House of Representatives get to their feet at the conclusion of the speech, there's only one thing that Australian voters, Australian families, need to think about. Has Mr Chalmers' second Labor budget delivered a plan to reduce inflation in our country? Because it is the inflation challenge which is the very, very, very most important and the very, very most urgent. And I want to quote from three people about the perils of inflation. The first person is someone who's well known to all of us, and that's the Governor of the Reserve Bank. The second person is someone who is also very well known to many of us, and he was the former President of the United States, Ronald Reagan. And then I want to focus on the former Treasurer of our country, Peter Costello. At Senate Estimates recently, I had an opportunity to ask the Governor about inflation in our country and whether or not Australians had actually forgotten about the corrosiveness of high inflation rates. The Governor said, in response to my question, I don't know whether there's a poor understanding, Senator Smith. I think people have forgotten. For many years, inflation varied between maybe 1.5% and 3.5%. We all got very exercised if inflation was half a percentage point away from 2 or 2.5%. Two so that was the world we were living in. People have really forgotten about how corrosive inflation was. And why is inflation corrosive? Because it erodes your savings, it entrenches income inequality, making it worse, and it really hurts the poor. I think we've forgotten about that because, as the Governor said, it's 30 years since we've lived in that world. And one of the perils, one of the very, very few downsides of our long run of economic prosperity in this country is that people have forgotten about the corrosiveness of inflation. I can see Senator Faruqi very excited to learn about what President Reagan might have said about inflation. President Reagan said, inflation is as violent as a mugger, as frightening as an armed robber and as deadly as a hitman, said the former President of the United States. And I see Senator Faruqi nodding her head in affirmation. President Reagan went on to say, we are victims of language. The very word inflation leads us to think of just high prices. Then, of course, we resent the person who puts on the price tags, forgetting that he or she is also a victim of inflation. Inflation is not just high prices. It's a reduction in the value of our money when the money supply is increased, but the goods and services available for buying are not. Remarks from former President Reagan and now, of course, to Mr Costello, who would have to take uh, the mantle as one of our, if not our, most su successful treasurers. Mr Costello said, as you know, we've been budgeting for a surplus. We have been aiming to produce a surplus because that is important to lay down funding for the future, for the expenses that we'll have to meet and is also consistent with good economic policy. He went on to say, we have now eliminated the $96 billion of net debt that Labor left the Australian government when it left office. Our budget is in surplus for the ninth time in 10 years. In 2006-2007, a forecast surplus of $10.8 billion. We've established a future fund which has begun to save for the future. With these savings, the next generation will be able to meet the challenges of their time. And Mr Costello's contribution then was very, very important because the bigger the budget surpluses, the wiser the economic management, and then we can have a higher degree of confidence that that downward pressure is being put on inflation and that governments are doing 
everything that they can possibly do. No doubt we'll hear lots of contributions this afternoon about the perils and the corrosiveness of inflation. But to understand it better, I encourage people to go to this month's statement on monetary policy to see for yourself what the RBA continues to say about the persistency of inflation in the Australian Thank economy and ways to beat it. Senator Payman. Acting Deputy Speaker, uh, President, um, and thank you, Senator Dean Smith, for raising this matter. It's a great opportunity for me to explain the Albanese Labor gov what the Albanese Labor government is doing to ease cost of living pressure on families who we know are doing it tough at the moment. Since we were elected nearly a year ago, we, um, we've been delivering cost of living relief and it has been our top priority and we've been working hard each and every day. I'm incredibly proud to be part of a government that is delivering cheaper childcare for families, expanding paid parental leave, strengthening Medicare, reducing the cost of medicines and getting wages moving. This is a government that understands the pressures everyday Australians are facing and is taking action, unlike those opposite who wasted almost a decade in office and still managed to rack up a trillion dollars in debt. The Liberals and Nationals have failed to learn the lessons of the election and have opposed our cost of living measures at every step. Now, the centrepiece of the Albanese Labor government's second budget will be $14.6 billion over four years of cost of living relief that will ease pressures on Australians. Our cost of living plan will directly lower price pressures and the CPI in 2023 and 24. This is in addition to $11.3 billion to support a 15% increase to award wages for aged care workers and improved paid parental leave and cheaper childcare beginning on the 1st of July 2023. The Albanese Labor government is delivering responsible and targeted relief that will not add to broader in inflationary pressure in the economy. Inflation has been driven largely by Russia's illegal invasion um, in Ukraine and the, the former government's economic mismanagement. And we know how important it is to get it under control. Our plan for inflation can be broken down in three parts, relief, restraint and repair. We're delivering targeted relief for Australian households, cleaning up the mess left by the Liberals and Nationals through efficient and responsible spending and repairing supply constraints through cleaner and cheaper energy, the National Construction Fund and more affordable housing. Now, speaking of housing, the Albanese government is dedicated to delivering on our promise for more affordable and social housing, and we hope to achieve real change in this space through the, Australia, the Housing Australia Future Fund. The $10 billion fund has passed the House of Representatives, and we now need the Senate to get behind this important bill. The fund will deliver 30,000 new social and affordable homes in its first five years. Anyone, and I mean anyone, who is serious about more affordable housing should support this bill. And yet, here in the Senate, we have an alliance between the Liberals, the Nationals and the Greens, who are saying no. The Greens' opposition to our Housing Australia Future Fund is not just working against affordable housing. It's a cynical political tactic. They use the housing crisis for their own political gain, peddling reckless and unrealistic policies to those who are struggling. And when, we, um, when an opportunity comes to deliver change, they say no. Housing experts across academia, industry and community support the fund. Power Housing described it as a transformative reform. The Community Housing Industry Association declared it was absolutely urgent that the Senate supports the package. The Urban Development Institute said, every day that passes is costing them, the Australian people, more and more. The Property Council said the quicker all of these mechanisms are up and running, the better. And the National Shelter described it as the most critical housing legislation to be brought forward in the, for the past 10 years. Given the state of housing in this country and this broad support, 
it's beyond disappointing that the Greens are standing with the Coalition to stop this bill. The Greens can't be taken seriously on this. They use the crisis to garner support and even shamelessly fundraise for their own political party. If the Greens were serious about their concerns in the rental market, they would be taking action right here in the Senate. Instead, they say whatever will help them win more votes and refuse to take action, making the housing crisis worse. We know too well that the consequences of what happens when the Greens side with the Liberals and Nationals Thanks. against progressive Thank reform. You, Senator. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. What a pathetic motion this is from the LNP. They were in government for nine years, and what happened? Inequality increased, house prices spiralled out of control, the National Energy Network basically collapsed, and wage stagnation and insecure work became entrenched. And here they are with a motion that boils down to barracking for more cuts to government services and higher interest rates. The unfortunate thing about this motion is that it seems to be precisely the approach that the Labor Party has taken to tonight's budget. Instead of helping renters or people in poverty, the Labor Party is choosing to give more than $254 billion in stage three tax cuts to billionaires and the already wealthy. The budget's big winners are very wealthy men. That quarter of a trillion dollars could be used to lift people out of poverty. Labor could solve the housing crisis, not just gamble on the stock market. They could wipe student debt. They have the power to help people, and they are choosing not to. In this cost of living crisis, they have prioritised a wafer thin surplus, they have prioritised the already wealthy, they have prioritised fossil fuel subsidies, they have prioritised nuclear submarines, and they are prioritising handouts to property investors. And yet, in the real world, every day, people are skipping meals, they are being forced to choose between paying between electricity bills and keeping a roof over their heads, they are choosing between heating or eating, medicine or rent. That's what's actually happening out there. And I thought a fundamental job of government was to make sure that people had their basic needs met and that they could live a life with dignity. This is a budget that delivers for property investors and the already super wealthy. Under Labor, the problems that ordinary people are facing will get worse. It's more than disappointing. It's a betrayal. I thought we had an election and changed the government. Seems we didn't get to change the policies. Labor's spruiking its supposed $14.8 billion cost of living package, but this budget spends far more than that on tax breaks for wealthy property investors with multiple properties than it does on any of the cost of living uh, promises. We've heard a lot about nobody left behind by this government, but there must be an awful lot of nobodies out there because this budget leaves plenty of Australians behind. It leaves low-income people behind. It will leave students behind. It will leave renters behind. It will leave disabled people behind. It will look after the top end of town, though. Those quarter of a trillion dollars in stage three tax cuts baked into this budget. Budgets are about choices, and this government tonight is choosing to back the winners, and it's leaving the rest of Australia behind. For shame. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, I'm very pleased to rise in support of my good friend Senator Dean Smith's uh, motion in relation to inflation. And what we should remember, what we should remember, is that inflation is in practice the greatest tax of all. Inflation is the greatest tax of all. And I want to quote to you from a book which I frequently quote from in this place, called Basic Economics. Basic Economics. And very appropriate, I quote from this book following uh, the Leader of the Greens' contribution in this place. And this is what it says in relation to inflation. Inflation is in effect a hidden tax. The money that people have saved is robbed of part of its purchasing power, which is quietly transferred to the government that issues new money. Inflation is not only a hidden tax, it is also a broad-based tax. A government may announce that it will not raise taxes or will raise taxes only on the rich, however that is defined, but by creating inflation it in effect transfers some of the wealth of everyone who has money, 
which is to say it siphons off wealth across the whole range of incomes and wealth from the richest to the poorest. So not only, not only is inflation a hidden tax, it is a regressive tax and it affects the poorest in our community. It affects those in our community who have the least options in terms of how they manage their economic affairs. And typically, we're talking about low and medium income earners. Now, I want to take issue with some of the contribution Senator Payman made in terms of this debate when she uh, defended the government's proposed housing fund. Now, let me say this about both the housing fund and the so-called National Reconstruction Fund. The fact of the matter is that the government has successfully passed the National Reconstruction Fund and is proposing the housing fund, which would total $25 billion of extra borrowings. $25 billion of extra borrowings. The government is actually proposing, in terms of the housing fund, to borrow $10 billion today and invest that to hopefully generate returns in the future which can be invested in housing. That's the proposition. So instead of simply paying for housing as we go year by year, they're proposing to borrow $10 billion borrow $10 billion, issue $10 billion worth of bonds or however else they propose to raise this money, go into the market, borrow additional money and then seek to invest it. And if you want to know the weakness in terms of that sort of strategy, all you need to do is look at the annual report 2021 to 2022 of the Future Fund. And it's the Future Fund which is going to be commissioned with the role of investing that $10 billion. And if you look at the results of the Future Fund, for the period ending 30 June 2022, you see the dangers. You see the dangers involved in that sort of strategy, because in the year ending 30 June 2022, in relation to the future fund, because we're in a high inflation environment, a very difficult economic environment for investors, they say, and I quote from the forward from the chairman Peter Costello. In a year in which global equities and global bonds fell by more than 10 per cent each and where the Australian stock market fell 6.5 per cent, the return of negative 1.2 per cent, negative 1.2 per cent, so not even taking into account inflation running in Australia at 7 per cent, the future fund, the future fund, not even taking into account inflation, future fund generated a negative return, minus 1.2 per cent. And it was the same with respect to the other funds which are administered by the Future Fund, including the Medical Research Future Fund, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Land and Sea Future Fund, the Future Drought Fund and Emergency Response Fund and the Disability Care Australia Fund. All of them went backwards. Every single one of them went backwards, even before you add the inflationary impact. Even before you add the inflationary impact. So the government is essentially, essentially going to be spending a bucket load of money under this budget and it's got to go out and it's got to borrow that money. It's got to borrow that money. And there's a bond issue, actually, at the moment, which will be closing on the 10th of May this week, bids closing this week, tomorrow, to raise $800 million, with an interest rate of 3.25 per cent. 3.25 per cent. You can go on to the Australian Office of Financial Management and see this. But what horrifies me is that on 21 November 2024, the government is going to have to refinance some $41.3 billion. $41.3 billion, which currently has an interest rate of 0.25 per cent. Senator Green. Thank you very much, um, uh, Deputy President. I'm very pleased to follow the good Senator from Queensland. Um, it's always lovely to get an economic lecture, to get these books brought out, to get quotes from Economics 101 or or economics for dummies. Let me bring out. What's this? What is it? Oh, this is. I've got a book here. What's this? Oh, it's ten years of Liberal National Governments. What have? What does it say? Oh, the Liberal National Gov. Liberal National Government doubled the debt. Doubled the debt before the pandemic. And it says, oh, the Liberal National Government doubled the debt before the pandemic and left taxpayers with a trillion dollars of debt when they were kicked out of office. That's what it says. Oh, let me quote a little bit more from this 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 book that um, uh, Senator Scar, economics. Oh, sorry, economics for dummies, 101. Note, 
the Liberal National Party opposes the NRF and the Housing Fund. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if the Liberal Nationals opposed more manufacturing in regional Australia. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Liberal Nationals don't support affordable housing and funding social and affordable housing. Because the real economics lesson that Australians learnt at the last election is that the Liberal National Party are not the economic responsible managers that they tell people that they are. They know, Australians know, that this inflation crisis that we are dealing with and the real pressures that they are under are a, a direct result of the previous government's 10 years of uh, messy budgets, rorts, waste, and not fessing up to the Australian people about the challenges that we face. Now, that's exactly why, when it comes to our budgets and the way we are treating the economy, the way that we are speaking to Australians and being upfront and honest with them, it's why the Albanese government has a plan for addressing inflation challenges in the economy. It's about relief, it's about repair, and it's about restraint. One of those words that wasn't in Senator Scar's book, wasn't in any of the former Liberal National um, uh, budgets, wasn't in, wasn't in any of the colour-coded spreadsheets, the word restraint. But responsible budgets can can provide and will provide cost of living relief. And we, we've seen this already announced by our government. We've seen it in the previous, government, previous um, budget in October, the measures to deal with cost of living relief. And I just want to run through a few of those now because this is the stuff that the Greens, on the other hand, say we're not doing enough to do when it comes to cost of living relief. Um, the $14.8 billion of cost of living relief in this budget we are delivering, we need to deliver that, but we need to do it in a way that does not add to inflation. It's incredibly important that we do that. That's why we're doing things like making sure that we have energy bill relief for thousands of Australians. Something that those opposite voted against the last time they had the opportunity. Will they vote against it again? We'll have to see. But you can't stand in here and complain about inflation and the way that it impacts on Australian families and then also walk into the Senate and vote against energy price bill relief. You can't do those two things. You, they can't do the two things because it says that you're not actually fair dinkum about making sure that people have money in their pockets to pay their bills. We're making sure that we're making changes to the single parent payment lifting the age from 8 to 14, an incredibly important measure for thousands of families, but particularly, can I say, for thousands of women in Australia, because we know most, most people, most families on that single parenting payment are women, and over 50,000 women will be the recipients of that change. We're making sure that aged care workers get a pay rise, a pay rise that the, they had to fight and scramble for under the last government, well, our government is funding this pay rise for some of our hardest workers and making sure that they get, they get the money that they deserve. And we're providing skills and training funding for childcare workers to make sure that they're able to meet the demand that we will see in the future. We're delivering cheaper childcare, we're delivering cheaper medicines, we're making sure that cost of living relief is at the centre of our budget and the centre of our response to this inflation crisis. Something that those opposite, no matter how many economics degrees they have, no matter how many economics books they want to bring into the Senate, no matter how many times they want to quote from learned professors, ever seem to understand that this is about families and that's what Labor budgets do. Senator Babette. Thank you. The words of Ronald Reagan. When a business or an individual spends more than it makes, it goes bankrupt. When government does it, it sends you the bill. And when the government does it for 40 years, the bill comes in two ways, high taxes and inflation. Now, make no mistake about it, inflation is a tax not by accident. Reagan was right. Inflation is bad, obviously. It is just like a slow leak in your fuel tank. You can still drive but you don't get as far. Inflation increases the cost of living, that feeling of dread when you open your power bill. $275, where's my $275? You're making decisions every day about what you're forced to go without. Maintaining a roof over your head costs more, rents are up, mortgage repayments are up, your wallet is empty. Every week you go to the supermarket, you have less money 
you have less in your basket for the same amount of money. Your children know something's up because all of a sudden you're saying no a lot more. So who drilled the hole in your fuel tank? Was it A, the Reserve Bank? Was it B, the government? Or was it C, both? Well, I'll answer that question for you. It was both. It was both. Now, the answer to our inflation woes is for the government to stop wasting money. Low debt is a policy for our youth. Today's public debt is our children's problem tomorrow, and I believe in protecting children. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, I, I rose in this place uh, before last year's first Labor budget, and I, asked, I posed the question, channelling that great political drama West Wing, whether the Labor Party had a secret plan to fight inflation. And the conclusion at that time, and after we saw that first budget handed down, was that they didn't have a plan to fight inflation. It remains very secret, Senator Macdonald. In fact, it remains so secret that until this day we see no plan to fight inflation. And as Senator Smith said in speaking to this motion, inflation is a scourge. And anyone who has lived through periods of high inflation, and whilst I was young, I do remember the high inflation of the 1970s and the effect it had on my family and their farming business. Those who have lived through inflation know just how corrosive, how destructive, how damaging it is. Why is it so corrosive? Because it erodes everyone's buying power. It erodes the value of the money in your pocket, the value of the money in your bank account, the value of the money in your pay packet. It leads to massive declines in real wages, and that's what we're seeing. This government, particularly when it was in opposition, admittedly, but this government used to talk a lot about real wage increases. We don't hear them talk about real wage increases anymore because they have overseen in their first period in government the largest declines in real wages we've seen in decades. In decades. The last coalition government actually delivered real wage increases. You might not know that if you just listen to this government, because this government tells big porky pies. They've actually delivered massive declines in real wages, and that is through their inaction on inflation. They have left all the heavy lifting to the Reserve Bank, all the heavy lifting to the Reserve Bank. They have done nothing in terms of the economic levers they control to put downward pressure on inflation. And you know, I'm a, I'm a great believer in the bootlegger and Baptist theory of economics, and I say, why? Why, why would they have done? They know how corrosive and damaging inflation is, because well, inflation does have an upside to governments. Inflation does have an upside to governments. Inflation means that the real value of government debt is, over time, eroded. And this comes at the direct expense of taxpayers. So whilst this government may talk about targeting inflation through, sorry, uh, dealing with inflation through targeted cost of living relief. I ask everyone out there who's listening to this, I ask everyone out there who's listening to this whether they feel they have received anything from this government to help them with the cost of living. And I suspect the vast, vast, vast majority of those listening to me today would say they've done absolutely nothing. Things have just got harder, harder and harder as they've seen their mortgage interest rates skyrocket, as they've seen the cost of food, of groceries, of, of fresh fruit and vegetables, of meat, of dairy products skyrocket, as they've seen the cost of housing go up, the cost of recreation increase. And all of these, all of these factors are even more highly magnified in rural and regional Australia. I was lucky enough in the last few weeks to, to spend uh, a few days in uh, Geraldton, yeah, to the north of Perth, and a few days in Albany, uh, about four and a half hours south of Perth. And in both those places, you see the corrosive and damaging effect of skyrocketing inflation. You see the pressure on people in supermarkets 
where suddenly they're paying to, having to pay so much more for their bread, so much more for their meat, so much more for their dairy. The added costs of transportation to regional areas piles on top of the already high cost of living in the bush. You didn't see the price of petrol much under $2 a litre uh, in, in, uh, in and around Geraldton, particularly in the regional areas an hour or two outside of Geraldton. This is the cost of inflation. This is the cost of this corrosive hidden tax on the, the mums and dads, the, the small businesses of this country, the farming families of this country who face these cost of living pressures every day. And tonight the pressure is on this government. That completes the matter of public importance.